Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is a study derived from the Book of Psalms in the Bible. This is lesson number six in that series for February 10 of 2024, entitled, I Will Arise. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Who's that talking about? Is it talking about God arising? Is it talking about us arising? Well, I guess we'll have to find out. We'd like to begin with a prayer, as always. Our wonderful Father, we thank you for the insights which we've already discovered from the Book of Psalms. Be with us now as we continue to explore some challenging portions of the book, but yet some wonderful insights. May they help to guide us in our prayers and in our singing and in our lives is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. What should we do about social injustice? Should we be helping the poor and oppressed? Jim? From the Bible study I guide, our age is not the only age in which evil, injustice, and oppression rage. The psalmists lived in such a time as well. And so, whatever else they are, the psalms are God's protests against the violence and oppression in the world, in our world, that the psalm excuse me, that of the psalmist as well, from the Bible okay. study guide. So when did the social injustice start or when did it end? <laughs> it hasn't <laughs> stopped. Okay. Did it on. start at, with Cain and Abel? Or yes. did it start? <laughs> Started with Cain and Abel and hasn't stopped yet. Read Ezekiel 16. Harry? Mosaic law commands God's people to take special care of three groups of people, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. And there's lots of verses there, I'm sorry, aren't there? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Usually these people didn't have a source of stable income. Many times they often didn't own land that could be worked or tilled to sustain their families. Now let me interrupt there for again, again for a second. What was supposed to happen in the Jewish system? Mm. Every, group, every person, every family is supposed to have a plot of land. And everybody, and that's supposed to be passed down to their descendants so that everybody will have at least a plot of land that they can work, right? That's the way it was supposed to happen. Okay? Ideal, these fringe citizens and immigrants sought to find places where they could hire out their services or, at the very least, be permitted to gather the leftover fruits and sheaves behind family protection. And so why does it mention Ruth there? Didn't I miss something there? No, you did fine. Yeah, no, you the you're harvesters. Fine. Such people didn't have family protection given their vulnerability. We can oh, see yeah. how the abuse of widows, orphans, and strangers was considered one of the worst sins in society during Old Testament times. The prophets regularly admonished the people to provide for this underprivileged class. Okay. Now, I, I think of, when, I, when I read things like that, I think of, okay, so David goes out with an army and a, a bunch of men are killed. And when they come back, what happens to their families? I mean, when they don't come back. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, when... When the war is over. When, when the army comes Adam. back. Yes. What's left of them, huh? Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we, don't, we don't think about that kind of stuff in our day so much. We do when we have a world war and a bunch of people, soldiers don't come back, but yeah. most of the time we're not thinking about the soldiers that, aren't, that didn't come back. Well, should we blame the devil for this problem, social injustice, as he's re directly responsible for the social injustice? I should have heard a chorus of yeses, mm -hmm. right? What could we possibly do about it? What is God waiting for? And of course, the ultimate solution, just right up front to social injustice is what? Heaven. Well, the second coming of Jesus, I would put it in yeah. earthly terms. There's a whole section that I, if you have a chance in the book of Reg Evangelism, pages 694 to 697, and you'll see what Ellen White has to say about the reasons why we're still here and what should happen. Anyway, the final end of the great controversy is never in doubt. 
God's judgment will come upon the entire world and every single person will be judged. We have no idea when that end will come. We have some ideas, but we don't know for sure. It will come in God's time, not in ours. We will never solve all the social issues in our world by our human efforts, but there are special groups that need our special attention. Okay. From the writings of E.G. Dell from um, Ellen G. White. By giving the gospel to the world, it is in our power to hasten our Lord's return. From the okay. Desire of Ages. Okay, good. So, can we do more for the poor and the needy by hastening the second coming or more by going out there and trying to find food for them and, or both? Mm. Ellen White said, by giving the gospel to the world. Mm-hmm. Okay, you want to pick up there, Jim? I mean, Gordon, I'm sorry. Second Peter 3, 11 to 13, since all these things will be destroyed <clears throat> in this way, <clears throat> what kind of people should you be? Your lives should be holy and dedicated to God as you wait for the day of God and do your best to make it come soon, the day when the heavens will burn up and be destroyed and the heavenly bodies will be melted by the heat. But we wait for what God has promised, new heavens and a new earth, where righteousness will be at home. Okay. Good News Bible. And Psalm 96, 13, Myra. When the Lord comes to rule the earth, he will rule the peoples of the world with justice and fairness. Is that trying to imply that not everything is justice and fairness in our day? <laughs> I think it's saying it straight out. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> we know that God's judgment will be perfectly fair to everyone. Why do we know that? In fact, each one of us will, in effect, judge ourselves. How do we know that? We will recognize that we have placed ourselves through our lives, through the ways we lived, either on God's side or on Satan's side. Every person who has ever lived will face the final judgment before, before God. While the devil is busy accusing us, this is Zechariah 3, Jesus is speaking for us, for his people, those who claim to be on his side, but he cannot lie about us or our behavior. So when Jesus is speaking up on our, on our behalf before the, the millions of, in the universe, what's he going to say about us? The truth. Yeah, they're terrible people, but... <laughs> The entire universe is watching with bated breath to see what the outcome will be. And that's, of course, Daniel 7, 9 and 10. God's judgment will be absolutely fair. In fact, each one of us will ultimately choose for ourselves which side we want to be on. It is in this life that we prepare for the future life. The wicked and rebellious people are preparing for God's judgment. Okay. Gordon, I think that's yours. From um, uh, the Great Controversy. A life of rebellion against God has unfitted them, that is the wicked, for heaven. Its purity, holiness, and peace would be torture to them. The glory of God would be a consuming fire. They would long to flee from that holy place. Okay, I'm going to ask this, you to stop for just a moment. Why would a wonderful place like heaven be torture to the wicked? They're not comfortable there. Torture is a little bit different than not comfortable. <laughs> well. Yeah. No, we, we get your point, okay. Yeah. I mean, what if you had to be loving and kind in everything you did every day? That would be hard for some of us. <laughs> wow. Is that what we're talking about? There's a story told, and you've probably heard this, but there's a story told about a man who died and showed up at Pearly Gates where there was Peter keeps the, you know, the, theoretically keeps the gate there. And he says, the, he said, Peter says to him, is there anything you would like to go do or see before you come in here? Because if you come in here, you're here permanently. And the man says, well, honestly and truthfully, I, I really would like to know what's going on in that other hot place. Peter says, okay, calls one of the angels up, says, take him down there and let him see what's going on down there. So off they go. And he shows up down there and here's all these people that look 
awful. They're skinny and bony and just look awful. And they're, they're sort of uh, rocking around like this and there's no ambition or anything. And then all of a sudden, here's this bell ringing. And he said to the angel that was guiding him, he says, what was that? He says, that's the dinner bell. And he says, the dinner bell? It doesn't look like these things have had anything to eat for years. He says, oh, come and watch. So he charged over there, and here, the, here was this long building with a bunch of doors, and there's angels at the doors. And every person, as they walked in to this building, they were forced to put their arms out straight, and a, a, a tube was put over their arms like this on both sides. So he looks inside, and sure, believe it or not, on the, there's a table just set with all this wonderful food, and the people are in there just... And, but they can't, they can't bend their elbows. So after a few minutes, the bell rings again, and they got to leave, and they haven't, and nobody's had a bite. And the man says to his angel, he says, that was awful. I mean, look at these people. And the angel said, well, just come with me. So they get up to heaven, and so they're just starting to move around a little bit, and he says, here's a bell ringing. And the man says, what was that? And the angel says, oh, that was dinner bell. He says, well, the people here look fine. What, what's the difference? So he said, come and see. And so he walk over to the building there, and it's a long building, and there's a few doors, and there are the angels with the tubes, and they're putting tubes on everybody's arms. And so he looks inside, and sure enough, there's everybody sitting down looking happy because each person is picking up the food and feeding the person on the other side of the table. <laughs> so if, you, if you're thinking about the other person, then you're okay. But if you only think about yourself, you're in trouble. Yeah. I'm sorry, you go ahead. So, I uh, was continuing with a great controversy. The glory of God would be a consuming fire. They would long to flee from that holy place. They would welcome destruction that they might be hidden from the face of him who died to redeem them. The destiny of the wicked is fixed by their own choice. We their, kind of said that, didn't we? Yeah. Their exclusion from heaven is voluntary with themselves and just and merciful on the part of God. Great Controversy 542. Well, now, heaven is self-selected. That's what it implies there, right? Yeah. Well, let's Very think much. about this now. So we, we Adventists are absolutely opposed to the idea of an eternally burning hell. What about an eternally burning, tormenting heaven? God doesn't do that either, does he? If nobody was self-centered, it's going to be there. Be no sin. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Even the devil will receive the just reward of that he of what he has chosen for himself. Myra. Okay. Mrs. White says, Satan sees that his voluntary rebellion has unfitted him for heaven. This used to be his home. Yes. Mm -hmm. But he's rebelled and he no longer wants that to be his home. Um, he has trained his powers to war against God. The purity, peace, and harmony of heaven would be to him supreme torture. Supreme torture. Yeah, we're not just That's torturing. Not yeah, this is supreme. Huh? No. His accusations against the mercy and justice of God are now silenced. The reproach which he has endeavored to cast upon Jehovah rests wholly upon himself. And now Satan bows down and confesses the justice of his sentence. Great Controversy, page 67. And that is based directly on Philippians 2, 5 through 11. We don't have time to read it right now, but right out of the Bible. So do our lives today demonstrate clearly which side we have chosen for ourselves? And have we chosen the right side? As we have mentioned in earlier lessons, God's government not only punishes the sinners, but also rewards the righteous. So now we, in our, in our legal system here, the only people who tend to go to court are the ones who are in trouble. But in God's system, he rewards the righteous. Everybody gets judged. The righteous get benefit, and the, and the, evil, the evil people go to their reward. There's a twofold, so there's a twofold aspect of divine judgment. Uh, Psalm 7, 10 to 17, God is my protector. He saves those who obey him. God is a righteous judge and always condemns the wicked. 
See how wicked people think up evil. They plan trouble and practice deception. But in the traps they set for others, they themselves get caught. So they are punished by their own evil and are hurt by their own violence. I thank the Lord for his justice. I sing praises to the Lord, the Most High. And that's sort of repeated in the New Testament, isn't it, Jim? Romans 6, 23, for sin pays its wage, death. But God's free gift is eternal life in union with Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay, isn't that pretty much what we just read in the psalm? Think of what a relief it will be for God to eliminate social injustice. Some Christians have a hard time recognizing God's condemnation of the wicked as an action of his loving character. Notice what, and of course, there are people out there who believe that God is just going to manage to save everybody. Notice what one of the psalmists said about this. Carrie? Psalm 18, verses 8 to 12. Smoke poured out of his nostrils, a consuming flame and burning coals from his mouth. He tore the sky apart and came down with a dark cloud under his feet. He flew swiftly on a winged creature. He traveled on the wings of the wind. He covered himself with darkness. Thick clouds full of water surrounded him. Hailstones and flashes of fire came from the lightning before him and broke through the dark clouds. Now the question I have is, okay, there's the picture. Did, did he see something in vision before he wrote that? Or where did he get those ideas? We don't know. Anyway, Jennifer, you want to pick up the Bible study guide there? Sure. Bible study guide. These hymns or psalms praise the Lord for his awesome power over the evil forces that threaten his people. They portray God in his majesty as warrior and judge. The image of God as warrior is frequent in the psalms and highlights the severity and urgency of God's response to his people's cries and suffering. Although David states that the Lord trains his hands for war, from Psalm 1834, nowhere in the Psalms does he rely on his battle skills. So who's, who's relying on his battle skills? David. David, David yeah. David's not relying on his own battle skills. That's, yeah, that's what I meant, yeah. Go ahead. Instead, the Lord fights for David and delivers him, from Psalm 18, verses 47 and 48, from the adult okay. uh, Sabbath school Bible study guide. Okay, David considered God as his only real weapon, more powerful than any other force on his side as he faced his enemies. At times, the Bible presents God as a warrior. Gordon? Uh -oh. <laughs> From the Bible Study Guide, there is a powerful metaphor about God in the Old Testament and to a lesser degree in the New, which is not too popular among Christians nowadays. God as a warrior. Oh, we don't like that, do we? Such an idea may be too harsh or militaristic to a culture that prefers the expression of God's love, mercy, inclusion, and peace. The Lord of hosts, and there are about 10 texts. And that's just a part of them, there's many more. Is a common representation of God's character. It depicts the, the creator as a general of the heavenly armies. He is involved in conflicts against evil powers, but the Word of God also describes him as a warrior. Quote, the Lord is a warrior. And some references. Exodus, All the way 15, back to Exodus. 15, I should say. The Lord marches out like a warrior. Uh, Isaiah 42, etc. Adult Teachers Bible Study Guide. Okay, Myra. Exodus 15, 3 says, the Lord is a warrior, and the Lord is, is his name. Isaiah 42, 13 says, The Lord goes out to fight like a warrior. He's ready and eager for battle. He gives a war cry and a battle shout. He shows his power against his enemies. Okay, now I'm going to ask you to think about this for a moment. When the children of Israel arrived in Palestine, coming from Egypt, how much of Palestine did they actually take over? Do you have any idea? Certainly, doubtful that it was even half of Palestine. 
when David, in the days of David and Solomon, how much of the Middle East was ruled by David and Solomon? Do you remember what the Bible says? From the Euphrates almost to the Nile. From the Nile to the Euphrates. So how did that happen? Battles. And who won those battles? Um, God. David, David says, I didn't do it. Yeah. So well, however he did it, apparently at least David was figured that God did it. Okay. Jeremiah 32, 18 says, you have shown constant love to thousands, but you also punish people for their sins, for the sins of their parents. You are a great and powerful God. You are the Lord Almighty. What do you do with Ezekiel 18 and 33? Yeah. That you, uh, people are, you punish people for the sins of their parents? Ezekiel 18 says just the opposite. Yeah. So what, which is the truth? Well, maybe, one, maybe sometimes in certain situations one is true, and in certain situations the other is true. Isn't the, the truism that God is accused of doing that which he does not prevent and that which he allows. Okay. God does need to be the active agent in doing something. How do you feel about a God who trains his friends for war? David was not only a skillful musician and writer of songs, but he was also a skilled warrior. He repeatedly praised God as his only deliverer and sustainer. And Psalm 144 is just one example. Was it wrong for David to credit God and praise him for giving him victories in battle? Don't we need an, an example I think of right offhand is this, the, uh, the story of who was it, Gideon? And what happened? He was coming up over the hill and all of a sudden there was a huge hailstorm and more people died because of the hailstorm than died because of Gideon's army. No, it was not Gideon. Who, who was? I've forgotten which one, but anyway. So God did more than what? Anyway, because he created us and sustained us in everything we do. Starting right from the writings of Moses, we find many places where God instructs his people to care for the widows, the orphans, and the foreigners. We've talked about that. Let's pick that up again because there's a comparison here. Psalm 146, 6 through 10. The creator of heavens, earth, and sea, and all that is in them. He always keeps his promises. He judges in favor of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free and gives sight to the blind. He lifts those who have fallen. He loves his righteous people. He protects the strangers who live in our land. He helps widows and orphans, but takes the wicked to their ruin. The Lord is king forever. Your God, O Zion, will reign for all time, praise the Lord. So just at the last there, there's a contrast, isn't there? God exhibits special care and concern for justice regarding the various vulnerable groups of people, including the poor, needy, oppressed, fair fathers, widows, widowers, and strangers. Do we, how do we find those people in our day so we can reach out to them? <coughs> do we go searching for them? Well, the Psalms, like the Law and the Prophets, are clear on that point. And there's Exodus 22, Isaiah 3. Notice some of the passages in the writings of Moses that direct God's people very carefully to care for these groups. Jim, I guess you're next. Exodus chapter 22, verses 21 to 27. Do not ill-treat or oppress the foreigner. Remember that you were foreigners in Egypt. Do not ill-treat any widow or orphan. If you do, I, the Lord, will answer them when they cry out to me for, my help, for help, and I will be angry and kill you in war. Your wives will become widows and your children will be fatherless. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Who's going to do what? It says God will do that. Well, it says the Lord will do that. Yeah. Go ahead. If you lend, excuse me, if you lend money to any of my people who are poor, do not act like a money lender and require him to pay interest. If you take someone's cloak as a pledge that he may pay you, you must give it back to him before the sun sets, because it is the only covering he has to keep him warm. What else can he sleep in? When he cries out to me for help, I will answer him because I am merciful. Now, I, I can't quite understand this exactly. Someone's, you take someone's coat as a pledge that he will pay it back. 
But you give it back to him at sunset? Does that mean? Says, don't give it. Don't ask for a pledge. Is basically what he's saying. But if you think you got to have one, please. <laughs> while God very specifically tells the children of Israel to care for the poor and needy among their own, He also instructs them to instructs them to care for foreigners who were in troubles in in trouble as well. We need to recognize that the poor and needy are not just people who are suffering from material poverty. These people are people who may be vulnerable and helpless. And God's compassion extends to all of his children throughout the world. Deuteronomy 15, Carrie. <coughs> Verses 7 through 11. If in any of the towns in the land that the Lord your God is giving you, there is a fellow Israelite in need, then do not be selfish and refuse to help him. Instead, be generous and lend him as much as he needs. Do not refuse to lend him something just because, where am I? Because the year when debts are canceled is near. Remember what happened there. Every seven years, all the debts were, debts were canceled and people were given back their original property, even if they had sold it for, because that, to get out of debt or whatever, back to their own property. Mm. Okay? Okay, do not let such an evil thought enter your mind. If you refuse to make the loan, he will cry out to the Lord against you, and you will be held guilty. Give to him freely and unselfishly, and the Lord will bless you, bless you in everything you do. There will always be some Israelites who are poor and in need, and so I command you to be generous to them. Okay, so would that work in our, in our society today? I think some areas they do. If you look on the news, that Jewish lady, she's working hard to get food and stuff in the middle of some of that war. Yeah, the Jews, some of the Jews do this for the Jews. Yeah. What about the rest of us? Are we doing it? <laughs> some nations in the world have social programs to try to help the vulnerable and those in poverty, and we know about that. However, we as Christians should do what we can to help them even beyond what they may get from the government. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 and several, uh, some other passages. How often do we think about the poor and needy in our daily lives? Jennifer, you probably think about them often because of the kind of people you have to take care of, right? Mm -hmm. God has spoken against the unjust actions of some of those put in authority. Using very strong language, God expects his chosen leaders to care for the socially disadvantaged. Okay? Jennifer? Um, Psalm chapter 72, verses 12 through 14. He rescues the poor, he rescues the poor who call to him, and those who are needy and neglected. He has pity on the weak and poor, he saves the lives of those in need. He rescues them from oppression and violence. Their lives are precious to him, from the Good News Bible. Okay, there's a remarkable passage in Scripture that Jesus quotes part of it, found in Psalm 82. In this psalm, God, through the psalmist, spoke out against leaders who pervert justice and oppress the poor people they were tasked to protect. Gordon? Psalms 82, starting with verse 1. God presides in the heavenly council. In the assembly of the gods, he gives his decision. You must stop judging unjustly. You must no longer be partial to the wicked. Defend the rights of the poor and the orphans. Be fair to the needy and the helpless. Rescue them from the power of the wicked. How ignorant you are, how stupid. You are, com you are completely corrupt. And justice has disappeared from the world. Okay, so who's he talking to? His people. What? The Israelites. Well, but specifically what group are the Israelites? These are the judges, aren't they? Yeah. Okay, what do they say? Verse 6, you are gods, I said, all of you are children of the Most High, but you, will, but you will die like mortals. Your life will end like that of any prince. Come, O God, and rule the world. All the nations are yours. Good News Bible. Okay, Myra, there's a ex an interesting explanation here. Okay, Bible Study Guide says, in Psalms 82, God declares his judgments upon Israel's corrupt judges. The, quote, gods in Psalm 82, 1, 
and 6 are clearly neither pagan gods nor angels because they are never tasked with delivering justice to God's people and so could not be judged for not fulfilling it. The charges against list the charges listed in Psalms 82 2 to 4 echo the laws of the Torah identifying the gods as Israel's leaders. Yeah, we don't have time, but we could go back and we could see yeah, Deuteronomy, it's all spelled out there. Yeah. God questions the sons of man, men, whether they judge justly and their punishment is announced because they have fa been found unrighteous. The leaders totter in darkness without knowledge because they have abandoned God's law the light. That's Psalms 19, and that's from the Bible Study Guide for Tuesday. Okay, let's look Tuesday. briefly at some of those Deuteronomy passages from the writings of Moses, Deuteronomy 1, 16 to 18. At that time I instructed them, listen to the disputes that come up among your people. Judge every dispute fairly, whether it concerns only your own people or involves foreigners who live among you. Show no partiality in your decisions. Judge everyone on the same basis, no matter who they are. Do not be afraid of anyone, for the decisions you make come from God. If any, so notice this, the decisions you make come from where? God. From God. If any, and if any case is too difficult for you, bring it to me and I will decide it. And so remember, they had that system where there was judges over 10, judges over 50, judges over thousands, and then ultimately, he went to Moses, and if Moses had a question, he took it to God. So there was, you know, it went right up that way. At the same time, I give your instructions for everything else you were to, gave you instructions for everything else you were to do. The judges who acted on behalf of God were acting in God's place. That was why they were called gods. As we know, God is the only true God and sustainer of the entire universe. No human leader can operate outside of his ultimate control. But think of how many corrupt leaders there are, there have been down through the generations, from the Caesar, Caesars, and back in those days to the 20th century. Think of Stalin, Mao, Hitler, and the present that have done so much evil. Millions and millions of people killed. Psalm 82 mockingly exposes the apostasy of some leaders who believe themselves to be gods above other people. Although God gave the authority and the privilege to the Israelite leaders to be called the children of the Most High, and to rep represent him, God renounces the wicked leaders. God reminds them that they are mortally, mortal and subject to the same moral laws as all people. No one is above God's law, from our Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Do you exercise any kind of authority over other human beings? Gordon, you're a physician. What about this? Are you exercising that authority with fairness, justice, and love? When a doctor holds the life of a patient in his skillful hands, skilled hands, is he not acting in God's place toward that patient? What do you do when you monitor surgical cases? Do the best I can. Yeah, okay, but you have some words to say to the surgeon sometimes, don't you? Go back. <laughs> <laughs> Reverse. Reverse. Don't do that. This, you're getting too close to some very important sub, uh, things in the body, right? Yeah. Some psalmists use very strong and harsh language about their enemies. Uh, Jim, Psalm 94. Psalm 94, verses 1 and 2. The Lord, excuse me, Lord, are you a God who punishes? Reveal your anger. You are judge of all. Rise and give the proud what they deserve. Good news, Bible. Some Psalms ask God to take vengeance while Jesus told us to pray for our enemies. Carrie? Some Psalms beseech God to take vengeance on individuals and nations who intend to harm or who have already harmed the Psalmists or their people. These psalms can sound perplexing because of their harsh language and the apparent discord with the biblical principle of love for enemies. From Matthew 5:44. And we all know that verse, right? But now I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's from the Good News Bible. Okay, Jennifer. From the Bible Study Guide. Yet the psalmist's indignation in the face of oppression is a good one. It means that the psalmist took right and wrong more seriously than did many people. 
He cares even greatly about the evil that is done in the world, not just to himself, but to others as well. However, nowhere does the psalmist suggest himself to be the agent of vengeance. Instead, he leaves retribution solely in God's hands. The Psalms evoke the divine covenant curses from Deuteronomy 27, 9 through 16, and implore God to act as he has promised from the Adult Sabbath School Study Bible. Okay, now let's think about David for a moment. He goes out to war and he says, God, you're the only one that can win this battle. But David still carries a sword, right? So, and I think about times like the story of Ahab. Remember what, what was Ahab's story? He went out to that last battle and he said, I don't want them to know that I'm a king. So he told the other king, you stay on your, you keep on your kingly garb and so forth. I'll go out as an ordinary soldier. But he's all got all this armor on him. Someone shoots an arrow from way far away, and where does it go? Right between... Crack there. Huh? You say a crack there somewhere. Right, a crack between the, the thing. Do you think God had anything to do with guiding that arrow? No. Couldn't. <laughs> I have a feeling there was some guidance Tongue going, cheek. going on there. One of the last psalms to be written is a psalm about the Babylonians mockingly asking the children of Israel who were in slavery to sing for them. And I, I'm sure the Babylonians, when they saw the, when they heard the children of Israel singing, I'm sure they had some good songs. They were, and they, were they, whatever, they, to the Babylonians, this was probably, I mean, I think they were honestly enjoyed hearing it. But they also like to laugh at the children of Israel because their songs were, of course, about the conquest and the, how the, the Israelites were doing well and all that kind of stuff. Well, what did, so what did, they, what did they write in response? So the psalmist wrote, Psalms 137, 8 and 9, Babylon, you will be destroyed. Happy are those who pay you back for what you have done to us, who take your babies and smash them against a rock. Oh, is that what God condones? Well, let's talk about what happened in the ancient days. When you went out and you fought a battle of, against some other enemy, they not only killed the soldiers in the, in, 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 in the war, but they went in and they took whatever they wanted and they killed the women, they killed the children. They, I mean, if we're going to... Not much has changed, has there? <laughs> not very much, well, we, huh? We've we a lot about, about that recently. real recently. Well, yeah. Human nature is evil continually. Do these ideas correctly represent the God of love that we worship? Our Bible study guide, Myra. Uh, this is God's retri retribution yeah. is measured with justice and grace. God's children are called to pray for those who mistreat them and even hope for their conversion. Bible study guide. Okay. Psalm 83, verse 18, May they know that you alone are the Lord, supreme ruler of all the earth. So, remember that in ancient times, what was their belief about the different gods? You remember? They believed that this God, of, there's a God for this country over here that's a God for those people, and there's a God over here for that place, it's a God for those people, and there's a one over there, and whatever, whatever. And they, they believed that the, the world had been it just sort of parceled out to the different gods. So what is he saying here? Saying that you alone are God. the Lord. God. Supreme ruler over how much? All the earth. Okay. Jeremiah 29, 7. Work for the good of the cities where I have made you go as prisoners. Now this is, what time in, in history is this being written? Jeremiah, when did he live? Oh. Time of Babylon. During the yeah. time of Babylonian captivity. He wasn't there himself, but he was, that's when he, when he was talking. Pray to me on their behalf. Pray for your, the people who have conquered you, because if they are prosperous, you will be prosperous too. Okay. Uh, my Bible study guide? Is it, who's next? Yeah. Jim? Jim? I guess yours. Bible study guide? Really? Mm. 
However, while seeking to fit these psalms with the biblical norms of love for enemies, we must be careful not to minimize the agonizing experience expressed in them. God acknowledges the suffering of his children and reassures them that precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Ooh. Divine judgment obliges God's people to raise their voices against all evil and seek the coming of God's kingdom in their fullness. What's going to be the final solution to all these social injustices? The second coming, right? Yeah. Go ahead. The psalm also gives voice to those who suffer, letting them, them know that God is aware of their suffering and that one day justice will come from the Bible study guide. Okay. Uh, the final judgment will take place at the throne of God in the holy city when it descends upon this earth. Now, we need to back up a little bit. We don't have a time to review all the final events, but the first step in that final judgment takes place when? Mm -hmm. when pre-advent judgment. Well. The pre-advent judgment, which we don't we can't be, I mean, the first step that we see, that we can visualize, happens when? I know the pre-advent judgment is correct, but at the second coming, because what happened, what kind of distribution happens at the second coming? Sheep and goats are just are separate. Yeah, the righteous are taken to heaven and the wicked are left dead here, right? So that's the first, what I call executive judgment. And what's the second part of that judgment? A thousand years later, what happens? All the wicked are destroyed. All they the, they well, choose to be destroyed. Yeah. Okay. The final judgment will take place at the throne of God in the holy city when it descends upon this earth. But before that final judgment takes place, the pre-advent judgment, which Gordon just mentioned, must conclude, Zechariah 3, 1 to 5 and Daniel 7, 9 to 10. How does, sinner how does sin destroy sinners? Does that apply only to the second death at the third coming of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and all the holy angels? Or does that process begin now? So now I'm going to ask another, make another comment that I've made many times before. If you look carefully at what we know about the second coming of Jesus, the reason, the way you can know that it's a second coming and that it's a real Jesus, how do we know? All you have to do is look up, because at the second coming of the real Jesus, the entire sky is going to be full of bright, shining angels. The entire sky. So if some guy's out of Palm Springs claiming that he's Jesus and he's come again, say, mm, don't think so. <laughs> don't think so. Where are okay. your angels? Hmm? Where are your angels? Yeah, where are your angels? So, Bible study guide, I guess, where are we now? Mine, I think, yeah. Where are we up the top there? But before that final judgment takes place, the pre-advent judgment must conclude. See Zechariah 3, 1 to 5 and Daniel 7, 9 to 10. Why does the pre-advent judgment have, judgment have to take place before the second coming? The pre-advent judgment decides or who's declares going who's going where. Yeah. And, and the angels have to be convinced that God's judgment is fair, right? Okay, go ahead. How does sin destroy sinners? Does that apply only to the second death at the third coming of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, and all the holy angels? Or does that process begin now? Yet the God who forgives takes vengeance on the wicked deeds of unrepentant people. That's okay. from the Bible study guide. 99.8, O Lord our God, you answered your people. You showed them that you are a God who forgives, even though you punish them for their sins. That's a good news Bible. And there's plenty of evidence for that in the Old Testament, isn't it? Think of all the problems that the children of Israel got into when they rebelled against God. The final judgment takes place on two separate occasions, 1,000 years apart. Step one occurs at the second coming when the righteous will be taken to heaven and the wicked will be left dead on this earth. And then what comes next, Jennifer? Revelation 11:18. The heathen were filled with rage because the time for your anger has come, the time for the dead to be judged. 
The time has come to reward your servants, the prophets, and all your people, all who have reverence for you, great and small alike. The time has come to destroy those who destroy the earth, from the Good News Bible. Now, I have a friend who recently uh, written a piece for a new series, Bible commentary series coming out mm. about social injustice and how that applies to how the Bible deals with that. What do you suppose is, he wrote about the time has come to destroy those who destroy the earth? Does that sound like anything you might hear in the news these days? There's a lot of people who think that we got to do this and that and the other, otherwise the whole world is going to come unglued, etc. It's called global warming. Global warming, yeah. Or is it global cooling? Well, some side's, one side's going to warm and the other side's going to cool, maybe. <laughs> these words, words, I'm sorry, do these words mean that God is to destroy the wicked? or to sin destroy the wicked. Right. Remember Romans 6, 23 quoted in number 10. What does it say again? Sin pays its wage. Yeah, sin death. pays its wage death. And remember we have this assurance, Romans 8, 34. Who then will condemn them? Not Christ Jesus who died, or rather who was raised to life and is at the right hand side of God, pleading with him for us. Good News Bible. And okay, you want to go ahead with the... The Bible study guide says, the Psalms are protests against human indifference to injustice. They are a refusal to accept evil. They are motivated not by a desire for revenge, but by a zeal to glorify God's name. Okay, why would that be true? Think back to Israelite times just as an example. How did God's name get glorified in the, time, in, the names, in the times of the Israelites? Not very often, but when God worked with them to do marvelous things, right? When they was, God, was God's name glorified when he worked with them to get them out of Egypt? Yeah, right? So on those few occasions when they were doing what they were supposed to do, and in the times of David, for example, God's name was glorified because they were doing what they were supposed to be doing. Okay, go ahead. Hence, it is fitting for the righteous to rejoice when they see God's vengeance on evil because in this way, God's name and his justice are restored in the world. Do you really agree with that? Just asking. I'm just asking. Yeah. The Psalms oblige people to well, raise... Me, okay, let's... let's um, so let me... If God's people are doing what they're supposed to be doing at a given point in time, does God's name get glorified? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What, is, what did Jesus say? You're supposed to be like a light, not under the bushel. You're supposed to be like a city set on a hill. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. The Psalms oblige people to raise their voices against evil and to seek the coming of God's people, pardon me, coming of God's kingdom in its fullness. In the Psalms, we are given assurance of divine comfort and deliverance. The Lord will arise, Bible study guide for Friday. And that is where we got our title for this lesson, right? Yep. Okay. Psalms 58, Myra? 10 and 11 says, the righteous will be glad when they see sinners punished. They will wade through the blood of the wicked. Ay. People will say, the righteous are indeed rewarded. There is indeed a God that judges the world. Okay, how, what are we going to do with that passage? I, mm. I have a hard time with that one. What do you do with the passage? It says, uh, Jesus says, I judge no one, but it's the words that I have spoken will mm -hmm. be your judge. Yeah. Okay. He's already told you, told you what, how life works. Okay. So in this context, we don't know. Do we know who? I'm not sure we know who wrote Psalm 58. What, what do you suppose they were thinking to try to just understand it? No idea? Not knowing 
where what I, I just the the graphicness of wading through the blood of the wicked is <laughs> sounds a bit like, like revelation doesn't it mm -hmm. what about the blood as high as the bridles the horse's bridles mm. that's what i'm referring to yeah well i don't know i don't know maybe david wrote this psalm um and what would you if you're winning a battle the old days, I mean, it was your sword against somebody else's sword, or your arrow against somebody else's arrow. Maybe this is the way it happened. I mean, it, it sounds horrific to us. And the righteous will be glad when the sinners are punished. Maybe we under, mis or can we underestimate the influence that Ezra had. On this, on this, Ezra didn't live till many years after this. this I understand that, but he edited a good chunk of what what we have in the Old Testament, and uh, he was using it as a as a code book of, to keep people in line. It was a uh, scare the daylights out of them. And, uh, yeah. Okay, to what do we have to look forward? See, I guess that's mine. Yep. When men shall revile you and persecute you, said Jesus, rejoice and be exceeding glad. And he pointed his hearers to the prophets who had spoken in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering affliction and of patience, James 5.10. Abel, the very first Christian of Adam's children, died a martyr. Enoch walked with God, and the world knew him not. Noah was mocked as a lunatic and alarmist. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Hebrews 11, and of course, what's in the whole chapter of Hebrews 11 is about what? Faith. Faith, Faith. and it's talking about this, what we traditionally call the giants of faith, right? What do, you, what do you do with these including questions? Including those giants called the Israelites. Yeah. They were including one of the those groups. those giants called... They were one of the groups, but at what time were they one of the giants? When they walked through the Red Sea, right? Yeah. Doesn't say they were, they were giants of faith all the rest of their existence. Well, consider these questions listed in the Bible study guide. Because the painful realization of the evil in the world can cause one to wonder whether the Lord actually reigns, how can we grow an unshakable faith that will stand strong even under temptation? I mean, you look around at what's ha happening in the world, you say, oh yeah, it's easy to have faith in God. And obviously, God is in control, right? No comments? That is, what must we focus on in order to maintain our faith in God's love and goodness and power? What should the cross say to us about God and His character? Okay. How many people in our world today think about Jesus at all in their daily lives? How much... How much off the last, last two words, daily lives. Yeah. How many think of Jesus, period? Yeah. Yeah. I deal with patients every day with all kinds of different kinds of problems. I'm particularly dealing with people who are morbidly obese. And you think about, you know, some of them, the only thing they can think about is eating. Mm. You know, I mean... Most, how many people even know what uh, who Jesus was, yeah. and, and what what his character was? Not, not that it, it's been distorted with, through the uh, preaching uh, of the teaching of this. How many young people, unfortunately, today all they know about Jesus is it's a cuss word? Yeah. 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 Okay. What must what must we focus on in order to maintain our faith in God? Why is it important not to rely on human means, leaders, institutions, and social movements as the ultimate wisdom and solution for justice in the world, but rely solely on God's word and judgment? One of the questions that two of the most powerful men in the entire world are going to be discussing, started today, and I think they're going to do it some more tomorrow, is how can we solve the problem of global warming? <laughs> <laughs> that should be the last thing on their list. 
In fact, they should redact that off of their list. <laughs> With, like, okay. <laughs> What are the practical implications of the truth that the sanctuary is the place of divine judgment? Now, again, what's going on here? We're talking about this, this, the judgment takes place before God. The Father is considered to be the judge. He, he sits there. And what do we know about it? Satan is making the accusations. The uh, and, and Jesus is responding. So, how can we understand the harsh language of some psalms? We've already talked about that a little bit. Do you think God is inspired behind, is inspiring that harsh language? No. But does he it, allows it. Okay, he allows it. How does that help us to relate to the humanity of those who wrote them? Were they real people? Were they ordinary people? Clearly, even from the days of Moses, the children of Israel were admonished to take care of foreigners, orphans, and widows, and of course the Levites who were to receive the regular tithes. But unfortunately, things deteriorated. So I don't know. Have you ever tried? I've tried to sort of figure this out. How down through the entire Old Testament, how often were everybody paying a faithful tithe and the Levites being supported? Well, what do you do with the... Uh... Jeremiah 6.13, where it says the priests and the prophets are motivated by greed. Yeah, well, that was... I mean, if you, your normal source of income disappears, what do you do? Well, then we've got uh, Jeremiah 8, verse 8. Yeah. The scribes have made it into a lie, and then Jesus, seven times in Matthew, says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you're a bunch of hypocrites. Okay, we've got just a few moments left. Isaiah 1, 17 to 23, And learn to do right... See that justice is done, help those who are oppressed, give orphans their rights, and defend widows. The Lord says, now let's settle the matter. You are stained red with sin, but I will wash you as clean as snow. Uh, although you st your stains are deep red, you will be as white as wool. If you will only obey me, you will eat the good things the land produces. But if you defy me, you are doomed to die. I, the Lord, have spoken." The city that once was faithful is behaving like a whore. At one time it was filled with righteous people, but now only murderers remain. And of course, he's talking about Jerusalem. You were once like silver and so forth. But it's time for us to conclude. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we look at these examples from the Bible, it talks us about the terrible contrast, contrasts between what was, should have been done, what the children of Israel were supposed to be doing, and what actually happened. We think our world, our world today, how many people are doing what they should be doing and how many people are doing just the opposite. Lord, help us to represent you the best we can so that the day may come soon when judgment will be done on the basis of righteousness and justice is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.